What does it take to become an elite 40K player? How do the top competitors overcome bad dice? The Competitive 40K Network presents Art of War Unbroken. Insight into the game plans of the top players on the planet with your hosts, Blake Law and the Art of War Coaches. Hello and welcome to Art of War Unbroken. Champions may lose, but their spirits remain unbroken. I'm your host, Blake Law. This is episode 16 of the podcast, and we are very glad you're able to join us today. They say we learn the most from our losses. That is exactly what this podcast aims to do. We're interviewing elite players who have lost one or two games in a major event. We're breaking down the mistakes that they may or may not have made, how they're planning to learn, how they're planning to learn from them moving forward, and just how to not blame games on bad dice. We've all been there. That's what the show aims to debunk. If you recall, Games Workshop just had their major tournament down in Orlando. I believe now it's been a week since we were last down there, but there's a lot of content to unpack from that tournament. And so for the next couple of weeks, that's what we are going to do. We are going to interview some of the best players from that event. We just interviewed Mark with his Bellacor Demons last week, and now we're on to one of the top two players from the event. We're talking about Sisters of Battle that did Battle with Admech in the finals, and that's where we're headed. This is part one of the episode, so in this one we will analyze the game We'll talk about the secondaries that our player chose. We'll talk about the mission that they were on, all the things that they did during the game, the things they wish that they would have done differently. We'll discuss those mistakes and the strategies kind of behind that. Uh, In part two, we'll go more into their list adjustments. We'll talk about any list, list changes, any strategy changes they plan to implement after that loss. And we'll talk about how your army will play into that army. We'll talk about what they think about the army going into melee armies and the shooting armies and the combined armies and just general elite player mindset. My co-host today is often referred to as Brad Edeldos because he's the second Brad behind Brad Nichols now. Um, He's also known as the cheesiest player in 40k. He developed the principle of the death onion. He is a nine-time member of Team USA. He won one Adepticon, maybe two, maybe three, who knows. He had three top finishes at LVO. He's won the Armed Forces GT this year. He won ACO this year, Mr. Brad Chester. I am definitely not Brad, too. I will fight this. I feel like we summed this up in last week's episode. I am the oldest Brad, so I am definitely numero uno in Brad. Y'all gotta, you're going to have to do the Brad Olympics. We've already talked about this. We might throw Brown, Brad Townsend in there, too. It might be like a three-person Brad decathlon. There, can, there may only be one. Three, three Brads enter, one Brad exits that's all there is to it i feel like we're about to do a a, a kenny rogers uh, song there too but we'll save that for later our guest today is the most overplayed beatles joke of all time i'm sure he loves to hear when you sing beatles songs or mention his name in any way regarding that it is the greatest joke of all time insert can laughter right here He's a 2019 ITC third overall finisher. He was the best in faction Marines in that same year. This year, he's won the Dallas Open. He won the Lone Star Open. He is just dominating Texas, and he will likely win the Austin GT later this year. He's the winner of Iron Halo 2020, Mr. John Lennon. You forgot to call him the Boy King. The Boy King, yes, the Boy King. <laughs> I'm glad that that's the nickname that stuck. Uh, I, that thing popped up like a week, like I feel like a month ago, people started calling me that on a discord kind of ironically and then all of a sudden it was everywhere but uh thank you so much for having me on it's definitely a pleasure to be back on the show uh of course it's a a bittersweet pleasure you know i I never like to have to admit that i have lost a game everyone else seems surprised but uh it happens more more than i want it to and uh here we are to document it are you are you throwing down a gauntlet for all the texas players this year are you just putting the gauntlet down on the table and saying hey i'm here i'm john lennon I'm here to win some Texas events. I mean, truth be told, I'm actually hoping to win a major outside of the city of Dallas at some point this year. But you know what? It's been a good run, so I'm not going to complain about it. Hey, hey, yeah, you got to take even where know you, can. you had uh, enemy. You're basically a full rerolls, but only against Texas. Yeah, yes, it's uh, vengeance for uh, vengeance for the Alamo. It's uh, zero command points. Uh, works really well whenever I'm in Texas. You're you you went to college in Texas. You're a Texas Tech or not? Te- you're a Texas A&M uh, alum, right? Uh, that is a mistake that will get you uh, shot in some parts of the state, but yes. Oh, you're a Texas Tech alum, of course. No, yeah, yeah, you're no, a Red Raider. No, no, The Red Raiders, baby, A&M. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, we're talking about your game today versus Mr. Richard Siegler. He was playing Admech, you were playing Sisters of Battle, and y'all battled it out in the final game. 
at the Orlando GT US Series last weekend. So, first of all, tell us what you thought about the Orlando event in general. What did you think about all the terrain and all that jazz? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually really enjoyed the event overall. Um, if anyone has been to the Nova Open in recent years, obviously not last year, unfortunately, but uh, if you've ever been, this felt a lot like a Nova Open with a bunch of GW posters all around um, and less people talking about Star Wars. Uh, it was a really good event overall. Um, I actually enjoyed the train format. Um, this was obviously their first time uh, running an event in uh, recent history, so this is the first time playing the new GW train format. Um, a lot of us had practiced on it and tried to simulate it. Um, luckily, playing on the tables felt relatively close to what we had been doing at home, and so we all felt pretty comfortable with it. But I actually really enjoyed their train format. Um, it had a lot of line of sight blocking uh, and obscuring, and especially it had ruins without windows, which uh, certainly felt good for uh, the kinds of army that uh, myself, Richard, and a couple of the other Art of War guys were running. Um, overall, it was just a very well-run event. Um, there's a lot of judges, never felt like... Uh, you know, we couldn't find a judge when we needed one, and luckily we didn't need one often. Um, I didn't hear any real complaints. Uh, terrain was good. Everything uh, was on time. Uh, overall, great event. I was happy to be there and uh, certainly looking forward to the next time GW runs one. One of the things I definitely want to ask you later in the episode when we get into kind of your list is I want to know kind of when you were prepping for the event, were there any changes that you made specifically after playing on that terrain? Because I know... Myself, for one, when I was playing in the event, I was just mentally, you know, documenting things like, okay, I think that change would maybe be better for this type of terrain because I hadn't played on it. So I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that as we talk about your list. Yeah, um, I actually, uh, it actually almost psyched me into playing a new army, if I'm being honest with you. Um, I knew that my sisters would do uh, very well on the terrain and, uh, you know, I certainly wasn't disappointed in them. But I actually almost uh, made a little switch over to White Scars just for the event. Um, because I thought that the, the playstyle would reward uh, fast melee marine armies a lot. Uh, sure enough, you know, uh, your fellow Art of War coach Jack Harpster took Blood Angels to very good effect. Um, so I, I think White Scars would have done well for the same reason, but I ended up sticking with Sisters. Um, I, had, I had actually thought about making a bunch of changes for the event, and I decided not to purely because hobby lag was catching up to me. Uh, just because um, after Lone Star, I didn't have much free time before I went off to Seattle for Charity Hammer. So disappointed you didn't get those more sacrosents in. Well, um, I, I looked at it, um, and I because I, I wasn't even sure what army I was going to be playing until I got back from, um, you know, literally until the event. But uh, I got back from a Charity Hammer on, uh, on a Monday afternoon, and uh, I was driving uh, to Orlando on Wednesday morning with the lady. So... I uh, I decided not to paint up any more sacrosins, and once I decided I couldn't paint anything, I specifically did not change my list so that I like didn't write anything else that I wouldn't have any regrets. Because uh, if, if you start playing and you've already got the new list written, you're going to be thinking all game about, man, I wish I had that extra X or Y. So I was very happy with how the list had played before, so I decided to just rock it out, not change a point, and uh, see how it did. You chose not painting models over a lady, and I feel like that's the least Warhammer nerd thing I've ever heard, so... Bad on you, man. This is a Warhammer nerd show, man. Well, not to worry. I am uh, actively building uh, units literally during this podcast. Hey, oh, my gosh. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Multitasker. So multitasker. That's how you become great right there. That's part of the unbroken right there. To become great, you must be able to build models, talk about a game, and whatever else Jan's doing. I'm sure he's doing a third thing over there. But for the, for one, for the third thing you're doing right now, tell us a little bit about your list. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this list is a very close adaptation of the list I took to the Lone Star Open and is point for point identical to the list that I took to the Charity Hammer GT. So uh, with two event wins under its belt, I didn't feel the need to change much. Uh, the list starts off with a Bloody Rose um, patrol, and that patrol is uh, Morvan Vol, my warlord, a unit of five Battle Sisters, two units of eight Repentia, a um, Repentia Superior, my uh, whip girl, as I call her, and two units of five Zephyr with Penance. Uh, moving on from that, I have myself an Evan Chalice Outrider. That Outrider is uh, led by St. Celestine and her two Gemini. And then I have a single Dogmata, a single unit of nine uh, Celestian Sacrosants. And then I have two units of Seraphim, two units of uh, Retributors, two units of Dominions. Uh, those Seraphim have uh, Max Hand Flamers. The Retributors have uh, two Multimelta, two Heavy Flamer, two Cherubs. And the Dominions have Max Stormbolters. And then I uh, follow that up with uh, three Rhinos total. Uh, one of them is Bloody Rose, and two of them are the Ebon Chalice. 
So uh, it's kind of what Brad and I like to joke about as a, uh, a Noah's Ark list, where I just take two of everything, because the rule of three is not for me. <laughs> I love everything about that. In the Noah Ark's rule, is it also when two rhinos love each other very much, a third one comes along at some point? Uh, maybe, but it's a different color rhino because it holds a different detachment, so it doesn't, it doesn't violate my rule of two here. Well, perfect. Um, Brad, how about you tell us a little bit about Mr. Siegler's list, the list that John played in the finals there? Mr. Siegler came in with a little bit different list than he was playing before. He went with his Metallica list. It has all of the Adbeck mojo. It was kind of like John was talking about. He was also looking for a list that could really utilize the GW terrain. So he's got double Skatari Marshall. He's got one, two, three, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, five man blobs of Skatari Rangers. One big blob of Skatari Rangers, 19 strong. And then he's got two units of five Vanguard. And then you go into the real shenanigans of the list, which are two five-man infiltrators, an eight-man infiltrator, two eight-man rust stalkers, a ten-man rust stalker, a unit of nine ster- sterilizers, and two units of raiders, one eight, and I'm sorry, one nine and one seven. And then he has one dune rider. So that had a lot of stuff. And that thing is, is going into this match, John, how did you feel against it, and how did you feel about the fact that there was so many things that could forward deploy and or scout move against you? Oh, boy. So I'll be transparent. I felt absolutely terrible about this matchup going in. Um, I had spent some time trying to figure out, because, again, this was where Dude, I didn't real, know. Real quick, John, can you help us out with uh, the mission that you were playing there? Yes, uh, we were playing on a mission, uh, I want to say it was 32. I know it's sweep and clear, the one where direct assault is the uh, the points. Um, I actually did not feel very good about this matchup going into it. Uh, to be honest, I hadn't been considering this type of an army when I first wrote the list. And then once I realized it was possible, I didn't really have time to make any changes. Uh, because obviously, you know, Richard is my roommate. I, uh, I I got the mail when I noticed that the box had way too many Sakaar and Rust Dockers in it for my liking. And uh, I very quickly figured out what he was up to when we got like six boxes of those in the mail. Um, I was not happy. But I I thought going into it that I had a lot of damage too, and I therefore had the ability to play the game. Um, unfortunately, um, Sweep and Clear is a little bit of a hard one because it uh, really encourages people to get in the center. And um, I think, uh, you know, obviously it's Admech, so his ranged output is not bad, but it's definitely lower than normal for an Admech list. So I would normally try to take advantage of that. But because, uh, you know, literally Richard getting direct assault or getting that center objective is worth so many points, uh, I was a little nervous about the matchup. And uh, I knew I could get points on it because sweep and clear is an easy mission to get a lot of points on it. But it's a hard one to outscore the opponent on when they're also built to do the same thing you are. So 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 I'm going to take a wild guess that you took stranglehold and direct assault. Uh, yes, we we both took that, hundred percent. What was the what was the third for both of you? Um, Richard ended up taking eradication of flesh, um, which uh, is actually just uh, I don't remember how it scores. I think you just write a fifteen down. Yeah, I was just about to say. Uh, basically, it says uh, kill the Dune Rider or let him get fifteen points. Yeah, um, and then I ended up taking no prisoners uh, just because he had a bucket load of two wound models. And I figure every time I kill a five-man squad, I get a point. Every time I kill a ten-man squad, I get two points. And hopefully, uh, we would be uh, duking it out in the middle. And uh, we'd kind of see how things rolled from there. Uh, going into it, give me... I know you were feeling super great about this, but give me your general game plan that you were throwing down when you first sit at the table. Yeah, so when I was setting things up, um, the what I was really hoping for was that I'd be able to go second. And then I could kind of just uh, try to keep it even with Richard and then have a bottom of turn primary advantage um, where I was hoping that with, you know, reserves and miracle vice, I might be able to make one or two plays to contest a primary in his part. And if I could uh, keep him low enough, then, um, you know, and get a, a strong turn five myself, hopefully eke out a close win without having to really kill all of his army. Um, and then, uh, of course, if I uh, unfortunately did have to go first, which uh, I did end up uh, going first in this game, um, my plan was that I was going to have to try to take a couple of turns of not getting hit. Um, and then at some point, I was going to need to push forward and hold the center to uh, deny him uh, some points or uh, do, like deny him some points because I knew he was going to take stranglehold and direct assault as well and potentially even get a 15 on primary myself. And uh, or I needed to protect my 10 on primary every turn and then, um, you know, send out a little missile so that I could... Uh, you know, give him a five here, a five there to compensate for what was almost certainly going to be a 15 at the end of the game for him. 
But I think that whoever went second in this game had a very, very strong chance of scoring a 15 on primary at the end of it. Before we go any further, I actually have Eradication of Flesh pulled up. It's pretty ridiculous. So you scored three at the end of the battle round. If you have an admech uh, vehicle on the battlefield, and if you killed more infantry models, then they killed vehicles. So I see why, you, that's probably why I took that Dune Rider, I guess, there to hide that. And Yeah, yeah, that, that's the point of the Dune Rider. It sits in the back. It is out of line of sight. There may be some scary murder bots in it. Maybe not, yeah, uh, depending good. on the turn. And then um, as long as that's alive, if he kills an infantry unit, uh, he gets three points. And uh, uh, it's one of those things, it's not literally a 15. Sometimes you can deny it on uh, turn one. Uh, in this case, I, I wasn't able to. Um, so he was able to get some uh, pretty solid points on that one. So tell us a little bit about the deployment. Like, how did y'all lay out uh, whenever you look across the table? What are the things you are prioritizing in your game plan as far as killing or move blocking or different things like that? Yeah, so my priority was um, protecting my rhinos uh, because I they're very essential for stopping his charges uh, because uh, if he doesn't kill the rhino in shooting and he wants to charge the rhino, then I don't care. I'll get the girls out and then we'll I'll punch whatever was hard enough to kill a rhino. So I was really looking at using the scout moves on my rhinos to make sure that they could get behind line of sight if I went second. Um, I figured that Richard was not going to go hyper aggressive on his forward deploys. Uh, just knowing Richard, um, he's a very conservative player. He doesn't like to take chances unless he feels like he's down. And I knew that Richard would not feel like he was losing the game before it started. Um, so I was expecting he wasn't going to take any, any big risks early on in the game. So I wasn't too worried about him charging infiltrators in me turn one, um, because if he set up to do it and I went first, I would just kill everything, um, because my army picks up uh, two wounds Skatari very quickly. So I was really looking at um, try to bunker down, uh, because of the way these ruins were placed, there was a ruin with uh, no windows in it facing my opponent, uh, so I had very good places to hide on both of my two objectives, or the two objectives that were closest to me. And then Richard had the exact same thing on his side of the board, so we would both kind of be able to get onto two objectives while staying out of line of sight completely. And so I was looking to scout move up into that um, that second ruin so I could very quickly get onto that objective and uh, start, you know, securing it to make sure that I was getting my primary points. That was my deployment plan: was um, put one rhino aggressive enough that he had to respect that I could I could scout move forward and get out retributors and, and shoot things. But realistically, um, I was always planning to scout move it uh, sideways and get behind a ruin wall so that I could secure my primary. Yeah, sounds sounds good. So you're you're basically planning on getting them out there, using them as kind of screens to kind of slow the onslaught of those models as they came and try to take the center. Because that's a game you don't want to play. It, exactly. Um, it, it's unfortunate because um, I guess to really, um, to really, you know, kind of like understand the dynamic of what this game was, I guess I should explain the threat ranges of both of our armies. So my army, um, I have. How about Miracle we just Vice. say far? It, well, it's it's far, but it's very defined with sisters. So um, I have a six starting from Miracle Vice just at the beginning of the game because of my Ebon Child's Warlord trait, and um, I have a litany that I can auto pass to give me plus one advance and charge. So the threat range on Repentia that are deployed behind a wall is twenty five inches, where. Uh, all I, I can auto pass that so that they advance plus one. I drop a six on the miracle ice. They go thirteen inches forward, and then if I have good miracle ice showing, I can just make a twelve inch charge. And uh, and with rerolls and you know all the shenanigans I have, I can usually get pretty good miracle ice. So I I have a very defined twenty five inch threat range from Repentia, twenty four inch threat range from Zephyr. And of course, I can use miracle ice to pass charges out of deep strike, but that can be screened out in the normal way. Uh, Richard, by contrast has um, the Metallica Stratagem to auto-advance 6 inches, and then he has a uh, Veteran Cohort Stratagem to advance and charge. And he can take a Rust Stalker unit, and he can, in the command phase, give it uh, plus 3 to its movement, which means this can happen on any turn. I won't know at the beginning of the battle round. So uh, if I'm going first, I know what his overall army has, but he can pick one unit to change in his turn, so I always have to respect that something could get plus 3-inch move. And what that means is that he can take any one of those Sakaran units that were mentioned. He can poke them with the magic stick in the command phase, spend a, uh, you know, a CP here, a CP there. And uh, a Sakaran unit immediately moves 17 inches and can then charge. And moving 17 inches and charging with a free reroll because of a different command phase buff means that my threat range is a very defined 24 inches for Zephyrim, 25 inches for a penchant if I have the Miracle Ice showing. Luckily, I did have some good Miracle Ice in the game, so my threat range was always right around the 20, 22, 23, 24 inch range. 
His is 17 plus 2d6, which is awkward because if I'm 24 inches away from him and he backs up a quarter inch, I now cannot declare a charge on him. But if he is spends his, his stuff here and rockets forward and he's 7 inches away from me, he now has an 81% chance of making that charge. So he can sit at a spot that I physically cannot declare a charge on him, and I have to sit there knowing that he has an 81% chance of charging me successfully if he wants to go for it. And that's tough on this one especially because there's a key point both of y'all want to take. So as long as you're able to play the play the inch game there and stay out of that range, he's always going to hold the upper hand on the on the going towards the center. Can you tell people why you feel like going second was a bigger advantage on here just for those listening? The thing is, is you're at a, and you're at a definite disadvantage at this point in time because in this mission, going first is a dumpster fire. Yeah, I uh, now I, I still think for the record that I could win this game going first. However, I think that my chances of winning this game were a lot stronger going second, oh, and especially sure. my chances of winning this game on the first attempt were a lot stronger going second. Absolutely. Um, the way both of our armies are play are planned out, we're both relatively MSU. We both have good close combat. We both have situationally good shooting but it's not just a shooting army that tables people we just have you know i can kill the one thing i need to kill in the shooting phase very consistently i think i actually shoot harder than richard but he's he's admech he uh he has plenty of guns when the situation calls for it um both of our armies because we have so many units and we have so many fast combat units are very well suited for holding our two objectives deterring people from coming to them and then going out there and killing uh, anything on this center objective and holding it at the end of our turn. So we both have enough units that we can throw, put a throwaway unit. Like he can put five rangers. I can put five seraphim after I kill the five rangers. He can put, you know, five infiltrators that kill the five uh, seraphim. I can put eight repentia that kill the, the five infiltrators. We, we can tit for tat back and forth on the center objective literally for five turns. And that way we'll make sure that no one ever gets a 15 on primary. And we'll make sure that uh, we get our own stranglehold and direct assault. Um, I actually was considering not taking those secondaries just because I didn't want this game plan to happen. The thing is that even if I don't take those secondaries, Richard is going to and he's going to go on the center. And if I'm going to kick him off of it, then I might as well get the points for doing so myself. Because if I fail and give him a 50 on primary, I've probably already lost anyway, so I might as well get the secondaries for it. But whoever goes second here gets that glorious 15 on primary at the end of the game, which the other one is pretty much guaranteed to never get. Neither of us have a tough enough army that I can put it on a center objective and look Richard in the eye and say, I bet you can't kill me if you really try hard enough. And Richard can't do it to me either. If he puts anything down there just in the center objective, in charge range of my army, I will kill it. It's pretty much a certainty. So at that point, going second, uh, we're both looking at getting several tens and probably at one or two fives on primary, just purely because we both have good trading pieces, but we're both going to try to lock down our tens on primary. Uh, the 15 is just an advantage that the other person has. And in a game that, uh, spoiler alert, is going to end up being decided by less than five points, getting a five-point advantage at the end of the game is almost certainly going to mean a lot. So speaking of which, uh, the advantage, five points, all that, where do you feel like you could have made plays? Or just kind of walk us through the game and tell us where you feel like you made kind of a play that you regretted or maybe you would have done something different if you played it again. Absolutely. So um, let me start off by... Um, going through um, what I think of, uh, I guess, like, let me start by giving, like, about a five-minute recap of what happened in the game. Um, so to start things off, um, I go first. I scout move, uh, get into my position. I put uh, a throwaway um, on the center objective, um, get my points, and uh, we, we work there. Actually, I'm sorry. What I did was I, I put a rhino on the line, and when I knew that I was going first, I John, scout just move. turning this into a house of lies in the first few minutes here. Uh, okay, okay, okay. I, I apologize, that was my second turn. So my first turn, I put a rhino on the line, I scout moved forward onto the center objective, held it in my command phase, which means it was mine perpetually, and then that rhino moved straight backwards off the objective so that I didn't have to expose a unit. Um, and Explain from, that for everybody that doesn't know the exact nature of this particular uh, mission. Absolutely. So um, sweep and clear is one of the two missions, along with vital intelligence, where if you hold an objective in your command phase, it is yours until your opponent holds the objective. So if it's ever contested or abandoned, it is still yours until your opponent holds the objective. So by scout moving before the game started, I started on the objective. And then I uh, just, it was mine. So I left. I didn't feel the need to leave a unit out there for Richard to kill, because I knew that if Richard wanted to kill any of the units on that objective, he would be able to. 
I scout move backwards. Which I is hide. A, I love that as a is a tactic though, John. Yeah, I mean, that's just a you blew over it, but that's that's such a great tactic that a lot of people don't realize they can do on vital intelligence and uh, search and destroy is that you're basically making your opponent come take that objective away from you, and then in a game where you already know that it's going to be, you know, you bring something up, he brings something to kill it, he brings something up, you bring something to kill it. You're basically trying to set it up so that you're not sacrificing something in that, you know, back and forth game. And I, I love that move a lot. You're 100 percent right. That's exactly what I was going for there. Um, so back to where I was. Um, my first turn was very conservative. I just hid. He had a unit of five infiltrators um, that was uh, off to a flank on one of my objectives. Um, he had, I think, he only had one model on it or or none. But he was behind an obscure ruin. I touched the ruin and got an angle to that one guy. Shot him with uh, some dominions. Uh, one of them actually ended up surviving uh, with uh, a wound left, but then ended up running to morale, so I, I didn't really bother me. Um, and uh, from that point, I didn't really kill anything else. Uh, and instead, he got to push up on me turn one. He committed uh, two units of Cerberus Raiders, one onto the center and wrapped it, and then one um, pushed up to contest my to kill a, a Dominion squad on an objective and give me a 5 on primary. Um, so I got a 5 the first primary. I responded by killing both squads and deep striking a unit and uh, Zephyrim charging it into his deployment zone, killing something and giving him a 5 on primary. So the what, first... did you, what did you have in, uh, in reserve though, John? Oh, of course. I had a t uh, 2 units of Seraphim, 1 unit of Zephyrim, but then I ended up spending a command point on turn 2 to bring a unit of Zephyrim into the sky so that I could deep strike it on turn 3 as well. For those um, for those listening, the move John talked about the scout move, where you go out there, you put a you put a unit out there, and you pull it back. That is actually called the island in the stream. It's a Kenny the Kenny Rogers reference, you know, the island in the stream tactics. <laughs> you, you were just <laughs> hoping to get a Kenny Rogers thing. It's some right, gotta get it in when you can, man. Hmm. I feel like I'm dating myself to not understand that reference. Uh, <laughs> um. So we ended up uh, trading. Please do uh, not make him sing the song to you, John. No, nah, I'm not going to. Um, we ended up trading turns of uh, five on primary, and um, I killed um, you know all the all the raiders turn one or on turn two as well as unit of five infiltrators with Zephyrim. Um, and uh, I what kind of ended up happening there was that he then cemented his uh, ten on primary, and I cemented mine, so we both got fives on turn one, and then uh, I got ten, ten, ten as we kind of traded back and forth over the middle. Uh, me continually trying not to overcommit. And uh, him continually sending uh, five man um, uh, rangers and like vanguard on, as well as something to kill what I had, make sure that he had obsec and was killing me. Um, what ended up being a, one of the decisive points in the game was that I actually had an opportunity to give Richard a five on primary on turn um, three when I uh, deep struck and charged a Zephyrim squad into a, uh, a unit of infiltrators that I had shot with Seraphim. So I sh there was an eight-man infiltrator squad. I shot them with Seraphim. I killed four of the eight in shooting, and I did an additional wound. So there were four guys left, one of whom was wounded, and I charged them with Zephyrim. And unfortunately, um, that did not kill the infiltrators. I actually only killed two models with that, uh, keeping them in mind that I cannot reroll anything when I target infiltrators. Um, and then uh, <laughs> from that point, the two surviving infiltrators managed a whopping 15 wounds on me by a combination of Admech stratagems and um, just uh, Admech being Admech, and uh, wiped my entire Zephyrim squad out so I wasn't even contesting the objective, and that gave him uh, a cool 10 on primary. And uh, I had really hoped that I would be able to... Um, uh, my plan at that point had been get a 5 turn, one, turn 2, which unfortunately I think I could have actually avoided, but in this case I didn't. But uh, get a 5 and then go 10-10-10. And I was hoping to give Richard 5-5-10-15 five, five, so that our primary would be tied. Because um, again, I was assuming that the person going second was going to end up with a 15. So I was thinking, well, I need to get, I need to give Richard one more turn of a 5 than he gives me so that when he gets a 15 to my 10 on turn 5, I'm not at a, an immediate disadvantage. Um, when this uh, ended up happening, I kind of realized, uh, uh, quite frankly, I, I think that that was actually the point where I lost the game. and. Uh, I think I could have done better before then, so that, that didn't lose me the game. Uh, but I'll go over that in a minute. Um, but from that point, I basically tried whoa, to whoa, throw whoa. as... That seems like a Brad Hour type of whoa, question. Oh, I was just going to finish the game recap real quick. There's not we much have, We haven't entered that. the witching hour yet, which is also known as the Brad Hour. 
where he just goes manic and mm, we are almost, almost at the brat hour um but basically i tried to throw stuff into the center and deny him the the 15 on primary at the end and um as we were tallying up the scores we realized that richard did not have to take the center objective to win the game he just had to get um uh a 15 on primary on uh, his um annihilation of flesh so on his turn five he didn't make a play for the center he instead um killed the unit of repentia with uh his entire army's worth of shooting very easily and uh from that point uh even though we had back and forth trade died killed a lot of things he ended up winning uh 84 82 without needing to rush into the center and so he did that because that was the easiest path to victory and uh it worked so uh richard ended up taking the game by two points all right brad lay the hour upon me now it's part two Part two is when we go into oh, the part two? specifics Ooh. of everything. Ooh, okay, we go okay. into the high-level mojo. It's, all right, well, I'm very excited for the high-level mojo. Recent, uh, since episode two, it's been called Part Dose with Brad Dose, or the Brad Hour. You know, there's many names for it, but that's... You know, this is where you're going to get other Brads murdered horribly when we fight in high-level style. Highland style decathlon. Is, I think we're going to do it in New Orleans, and it's going to be glorious. So for those, that, that's something to look forward to if you're going to the, the GW New Orleans event. The, the Brad Decathlon. John, you could be a Brad. We could maybe we could maybe sub you in as a Brad. I'm disappointed that you think so little of me. <laughs> Hurtful talk. Hurtful talk. Well, John, thanks for recapping the game. Is there, there's a couple other questions I have for you here. One would be when you look across the table and you see Richard Siegler's ad mech, do you feel like that is a good, bad, neutral matchup for you and why? Yeah, so I feel like it's a bad matchup, but I feel like it's not an insurmountable one. Um, I think my biggest issue in this game, actually, um, was uh, the practice difference between Richard and I. Um, I. Honestly, the biggest problem is that his Adamek list does almost the exact same play style that I do, which means that I need to change my play style slightly. And, um, and it, that, that is doable. It is a winnable game. I think if we were to play again, I would have a better chance of victory. Certainly not a guarantee, but uh, I think a better one. Uh, but the big thing is that um, Richard has played against my sisters like six or seven times with a bunch of different armies as he helps me uh, helped me get ready for uh, the Lone Star Open uh, to great success. Uh, however, I had not played against his Metallica Admech once until that game, so I think he had a little bit better of a game plan going into it than you I did. You had some shenanigans you weren't necessarily uh, aware of, possibly, some of the... Sh um, I actually knew all of his rules. Um, there, were, there was no moment where he pulled something out. I'm like, man, I didn't think of that combo. I think the big thing was just putting it on the table uh, I didn't realize the right, right plays I needed to do because I'd only gone through it in theory. I hadn't put it on the table. So once we got down into the nuances of it, I realized I needed to change my play style a little bit more than I did. My other question for you is there's going to be some players who are wanting to play Sisters of Battle, and they're going to start by playing your list. That's just a given. So if you if you were talking to a new player who is picking up your list, they're going out and buying all the models, what's one piece of advice you'd give that new player? Um, my first, I guess my first piece of advice with Sisters is to um, uh, accept that the army is relatively fragile and to uh, kind of manage your resources and only use as much as necessary. Um, the Sisters Army is very much a measured tempo kind of army where you don't usually have an all-out turn early on in the game. Instead, you want to have a lot of pre-measuring done and take very reliable plays early on to get an advantage. And uh, once you get any kind of an advantage going with the army, Usually you force your opponent to try to respond to you. And as soon as someone enters the, uh, you know, what I call the kill ground, which is stepping inside of 24 inches of the bulk of the sisters. Would, army, would you like to call it the danger zone? Hey, you know what? I'll allow that one. Um, if they step into the sisters danger zone, which is stepping within 24 inches when you're suddenly getting hit by auto charging or pension retributors, flamers, storm bolters and everything else in the world and Celestine. Uh, once you step into that spot, it is uh, it is harrowing indeed because sisters have insane damage output within 24 inches. So I always try to play a very measured game where I preserve resources, take safe plays, and try to eke out a small points advantage. And then once my opponent realizes that I have a points advantage that I can sit on for the whole game, they are kind of forced to react. And sisters are very punishing for people who step up to them. John, thanks for coming on part one with us. I'm going to absolutely, Brad's going to go absolutely crazy on you on some questions in part two, where we're just going to talk about, we're going to discuss that that uh, move you made there in the game and what you think you could have done different on it. We're going to talk about your list. We're going to talk about how your list plays into other lists. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff in the Witching Hour. So for those of y'all listening, check out part two. Go to theartofwar40k.com. Subscribe to part two. Give us a listen. Give us, give us one shot. See what you think.
But for the last part of the episode, we're going to do our Q&A, which we always do. The Q&A is open to all War Room members, which is also part of the Art of War 40K.com. Go on there, subscribe. It's a private Facebook channel where we have coaching services every day. Coaches like John Lennon, uh, Richard Siegler, Nick Notavati, Brad Chester, a whole pantheon of coaches get on there and they play coaching matches. They do different coaching sessions where they talk about different factions, different tactics. It's just all in all a very great value. So go on there, check it out. And as an added bonus, we do do a and a each week for our guest. This week we have a, one question, which I will say is relatively silly. So prepare yourself, John. It comes from Mr. Hunter, Hunter Nichols, who has asked questions previously on our show. He says, John, I see that you are currently number one in the ITC, but you have not beat me. Hmm. Can't claim to be the best if you haven't beaten the rest. Um... Well, what can I say? Uh, unfortunately, when I'm doing well at a tournament, I'm limited to only playing against people who have won a game. Uh, that's the way win path works. So maybe, just maybe, uh, I'll get Connor uh, round one. Uh, but until then, or Hunter. Um, uh, but uh, until then, uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Our other question comes from myself, Blake Law. And the question is, what Imperial Knight <laughs> household would you run if you're going to run Imperial Knights? Uh, if, if the question is what household I would run, it would be House Crast. However, there is the strong argument to be made for not running a household at all and instead going all in on the free blades. Uh, I gotta say, the idea of a Megara that is both objective secured and can heroically intervene six inches, it does appeal well, that, to me. That was actually a joke question, but that is a very good answer. Uh, I've asked John indirectly about four different ways on what, which household he would take uh, with the Imperial Knight, so... That's that's the fifth time, the fifth and final time, John, I promise. So, all right, that is all of our questions right now. Make sure to check us out. We've already given you the info. Go to the Art of War 40k.com. Check out all we have to offer. Check out our other shows, Art of War Vanilla with Tim Penny and John Lennon. And make sure to check out the Art of War Down Under with Adam Camilleri. I love everything about the fact that it's the Art of War Vanilla. And we are the Art of War Pistachio. We're the show you didn't know you liked till you tried us. So, as always, stay classy. Listen to part two. Later, guys. Like what you just listened to? Check out Art of War and the Art of War Down Under podcast on the competitive 40K network. The Art of War 40K.com. 